may be seated. What a wonderful hymn to prepare our hearts for the preaching of the Word of God this morning. If you have a copy of the Word of God with you this morning, I do invite you to turn to the Gospel of Luke and to the 13th chapter. If you're visiting with us this morning, you're most welcome. And if you don't have a copy of the Scriptures with you, there should be one close by in one of the seats. You may avail yourself of that and read along with us as we read together in the Word of God. We are at the last section of Luke chapter 13, and that is verse 31, and we shall read to the end of the chapter. Luke 13, and we shall commence to read at the 31st verse. This is the Word of God. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, that is to Jesus, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O Jerusalem! Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Let us seek the Lord and ask his help as we come this morning to his holy word. Let's pray together. Father, we have been singing that you would show us Christ through the preaching of your word. And so again, Lord, we ask you to hear our prayer. We thank you that we have the Holy Scriptures. We thank you that they do reveal to us your Son, We do pray now that by the power of your Holy Spirit you would come and you would minister to each and every one of us and that as we again, O God, would hear the words of your Son as he walked upon the earth and as we would seek to understand what they teach and what they mean, that, O our God, we might indeed see something of the glory, something of the majesty and the wonder of your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, Father, as we see these things this morning, we pray that we would be a people who are affected by these things. We pray, Father, that we would be a people who are changed by these things. That, Father, you would enable us in understanding the things that we learn to put these things into practice, that we would seek you for these things, and that we would embody these things ourselves. That we, O God, in seeing Christ, would become like Christ. For you have redeemed us that we might be conformed to the likeness of your Son. And so we ask, O God, that you would hear us this morning. Hear our prayer and answer for Jesus' sake. Amen. Position of heart that the Lord Jesus Christ possesses toward you as a Christian. Certainly, if you are a Christian, there's no doubt that at some point in your life and at some time or another, and hopefully on a continual basis, this is something you think about. What is the heart of Christ towards me right now? What has the what is the heart of Christ towards me been like ever since he came into the world in order to save me from my sin? What has the eternal heart of Christ been toward us as his people? Perhaps if you're a non-Christian it is possible that you haven't considered such an idea. Perhaps you have considered it a little bit. Perhaps it has never been something that has crossed your mind. I think it's an important thing for us as the people of God to think about our Savior and how He views us and how 
his heart is disposed toward us to consider him. And the writer to the Hebrews causes us to think upon his heart that can sympathize with us in our weaknesses and in our failures. And I think as Christians, we can often neglect to just spend time thinking upon Christ and considering his heart toward us. And I think if we fail to do that, then, of course, we will never truly grow in possessing the heart of Christ toward others, which is what we are called to if we are Christians. How, then, can we establish a picture, establish an understanding of the heart of Christ toward us as His people. It's an important thing. It's a, a thing that we ought to try to do. Uh, what has been interesting for me over the years is to, to gather different books that are available on what is called the emotional life of Christ. I'm reading a pretty good one right now that it's not only the emotional life of Christ, but it's the whole matter of our emotional life and how God would have us uh, to relate to Christ through faith, and I'm doing that for the men's retreat. It's, it's a book by Brian Borgman on faith and feelings, and I'm going to talk to Brian about that at our men's retreat. It has been stirring my heart in some directions regarding this whole matter. Reading recently Thomas Goodwin, the Puritan, on this whole subject of Christ's disposition of heart towards his people, I've been thinking upon these things. And when I came to this passage this morning, I found this when I was reading through one of my commentaries that I've been using. Philip Riken, he quotes B.B. Warfield on an essay that Warfield did back in the 19th century on the emotional life of Christ. And Riken comments on this text in Luke 13 that is before us, and he says this, No one has ever had a more dynamic emotional life than the Lord Jesus Christ. He did not go through life with unmoved serenity, but passionate intensity. That made me think about the heart of Christ toward me, toward His church, toward the world. And as I came to this text and thought through this text, I began to think, well, what does this text really tell me about my Savior and, and His heart? And how are we to understand this as his people. Why has Luke put this here for us as Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem? Luke wants us to walk with him and to hear him and to contemplate him and to think upon him. And what does he show us here in this text? I think he shows us here something of the saving heart of Jesus. And so it is to this idea that I want to turn your attention this morning, the saving heart of Jesus that comes out in this passionate, intense passage where our Lord Jesus Christ is once again engaging the Pharisees, once again dealing with his detractors, once again having to speak directly to those who are not for him. There are four things that I want us to look at this morning as we seek to see something of the saving heart of Christ in this passage. The first one that I want you to, the first thing I want you to see is that our Lord's saving heart, I believe here, is displayed in his courage. In his courage. Now, the text tells us that our Lord is on his way. He's traveling through the towns and the villages. He's preaching the message of the kingdom. And Luke tells us at a particular given point, some Pharisees came with some information for Jesus, some news that they wanted to give to Jesus. They said to him, get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. Now, as our Lord is traveling through Galilee and up toward Jerusalem. He knows that at Jerusalem he is to be arrested, he is to be tried, he is to be crucified, and on the third day he will rise from the dead. Uh, he encounters here again the religious establishment of Israel in the form of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were never far away from Jesus. 
And there'll be groups of them sent out to listen to him, to evaluate what he's saying, and to try and catch him in his words, and to try and expose him as a false teacher, or whatever they could get on him, they were trying to get on him. It's interesting, they were the hyper-conservatives of the day, strictly adhering to the law and scrupulous things about the law, though they misunderstood the law and misapplied the law. But they were always on his heels, always waiting, always watching, always lurking, always wanting to catch him. And on this occasion, Luke tells us that they come to him and they bring him a warning. It's a significant warning. It's not a small warning. Uh, but they tell him that uh, being in the land where Herod of Antipas is the tetrarch, the, the local governor under the Roman rule, that, uh, that, that they're aware that Herod... Antipas wants Jesus dead. Now, I don't know about you, but if I got a message that told me that someone wants me dead, I sometimes wondered if some people want me dead as a pastor at times, but nothing as serious as this. I certainly would be afraid. I certainly would be fearful. There would certainly be a measure of dread would run through my body especially someone who has the power to actually do it, which Herod clearly had. Why? Because we've met him before in Luke's gospel. This is the same Herod that had Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, put to death. This is the same Herod that was uh, duped into the execution of John the Baptist by a woman that he was engaged in an, adulter an adulterous relationship with. So Jesus was aware when he heard this news from the Pharisees that this was not in a, an idle threat. This was not someone just uh, taking a pot shot at Jesus that couldn't fulfill it. It was highly possible that Jesus was being targeted by this man. Now, we're not told very much more in this passage about this event other than it came to Jesus through the Pharisees. But we can't help but ask ourselves, is there a conspiracy here? Is there a conspiracy with the religious establishment and the political leadership? We certainly know that's growing. When Jesus gets to Jerusalem, it's all going to come together. The Jews and the Gentiles the Jewish religious establishment and the Roman government. And they're all going to come together. The forces of darkness are going to eventually come together to put him to death. Certainly here, it's quite possible that the Pharisees were conspiring. How did they know that Herod wanted to do this? We're not told. There's plenty of speculation in the commentaries. We're not absolutely certain. Did they have close connection to him? Were these Herod's friends in the higher circles who were the religious establishment? We're not told. All we're told is this, that this threat to his life comes very clearly, very powerfully, and without apology. You need to get out of Galilee, Jesus, because Herod wants to kill you. There is a price on your head. Just like John the Baptist, you could lose yours. Now, as we read that, we say, well, how did Jesus respond? And here's where we see his courage. Here's where we see the most remarkable response from the mouth of our Savior. This is no idle threat. This is a real possibility. It's a clear and present danger in the life of Jesus. But notice what he says. Remarkable statement. He says, go and tell that fox... Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow and the third day I finish my course. Now, what's he saying? I had a little bit of a chat about this this week. What does he mean? Go and tell that fox. We well, get all hung up, don't we, when people say, well, you can't say things like that about your leaders. Jesus is, of course, the Lord. He can say whatever should be said. And it's true, we're not Jesus, so we have to be careful. But it's interesting. What is a fox but a cunning little creature? A sly little chap. That's really essentially what a fox is. I've only ever seen one fox very close up 
in the countryside where we lived in Northern Ireland. We had a lane, it was about a quarter of a mile to the main road. And uh, there were many things that we used to enjoy doing, walking up and down that lane. But one particular day I remember going out and there was a fox caught in the hedge. Foxes close up are a little scary, especially when they're foaming at the mouth and they're caught. And you don't want to be the one that releases it just in case. And yet they're beautiful little animals, but they're sly little creatures, cunning. And I think that's the idea that Jesus has here as he he thinks about Herod. And he knows something of the story of John the Baptist. And he knows something of the the political expediency of the man. Again, Riken in his commentary quotes a man called T.W. Manson. I'm not familiar with who he is, but he said this. And speaking of the Jewish usage of this idea, it, it typifies low cunning as opposed to straightforward dealing. And it is used in contrast to a lion to describe an insignificant third-rate person as opposed to a person of real power and greatness. Was Jesus saying, tell that not-so-significant leader who's a sly and cunning chap, I'm not leaving Galilee till I've done what God sent me here to do, because that's what he basically says. I'm casting out demons. I'm performing cures. I'm serving God, and I'm going to be doing it today and tomorrow. And and on the third day, I'll finish my course. I'll be done. I'll be moving on. But I'm not leaving till I'm done. I'm not getting out until it's finished. I'm serving God, not Herod. I'm doing the will of God, not the will of Herod. That's what Jesus is basically saying here. You see his courage to do the will of God, even in the face of threats to his life. He will not be put off. He will not be distracted. He will not be hindered. Herod's threat doesn't phase the Son of God in doing the will of God. He keeps his face straight towards Jerusalem, and he continues to do what he believes the will of God is in doing these miracles. Amazingly and ironically, doing good in Galilee, in amongst Herod's people who wants to do Jesus harm. But he will not be thwarted. He will not be intimidated out of his calling by this cunning little cunning chap called Herod. He's not faced. He's a man of courage. This is his heart, you see. This is the heart of Christ, courageously committed to doing the will of God, no matter what it costs him. I know, my dear brothers and sisters, when I think upon this, this is our captain, the captain of our salvation. This is the leader. This is the one who has gone before us to accomplish our redemption. This is the one who has saved us from our sins, and he is calling us to walk as he walked. And as I think about this, my heart laments the lack of courage the church of Christ has in the light of the courage of heart that our Savior has had. Think upon it. As Christians, we need to see our Lord's saving heart toward us was a heart marked by courage, courage to do the will of God, no matter what the cost was. To do the will of God, no matter what the threats were. Jesus went before us courageously, overcoming the world, resisting the devil, all the way to Jerusalem, to the cross, to save us from our sins. We say we want to be like Jesus. Well, okay. It seems to me that one of the things that's in short supply in the Christian church today is the grace and the virtue of courage. Courage to do the will of God, no matter what it costs us. I think courage is in great, in short supply in the church in the West, not so much in the East, where you really can suffer for Jesus. People really die in other countries. I was watching a little thing yesterday about Pakistan, and uh, I've had contacts there for many years. Pakistan is a scary place to be a Christian. You could really die if you're a Christian in Pakistan, and it could be today or tomorrow 
It takes courage to stand for Jesus in Pakistan. But how tragic in a place like our country and in our part of the world where the reality is that we have all the conveniences and all the luxuries and in many ways still all the freedoms, we are so lacking in courage. Lacking in courage. Unwilling to face the cost. Compromising, silent, not standing for the will of God, lacking courage. Jesus has gone before us, brothers and sisters, and he is a man who has gone before us with a heart of courage. Courage to save us, bring us to glory. And he calls us now, O Christian, be of good courage. I have overcome the world. So can you. Now, I'm not saying by that that you and I are to suddenly start some kind of movement that we want to get burnt at the stake. That's not what I'm saying. It may be something as simple this morning as in your marriage, you need courage to do the will of God, to do the will of God as a husband, to do the will of God as a wife. It takes courage, but you're, you're fearful because there are threats coming from your spouse on the other side. Well, if, if you follow Jesus, this is what it will mean. And you're, you're fearful, and you don't want to do it, and you're, you're backing off. I say to you, oh, be of good courage. Savior is able to give you strength to be faithful to the will of God, to serve Christ. You're single pressures you face today in our over-sexualized culture and perverse culture to simply throw it all off, your pursuit of purity. Throw it all off in terms of honoring Christ. And you know, you, in the workplace, you're, you're mocked, you're scoffed, people laugh at you. The idea that you would be a virgin young woman in your mid-twenties because you've never been married is, is mocked by the world. It takes courage to do the will of God in the face of detractors. But be of good courage. Christ has overcome the world. He has overcome the sly, cunning little chap. You can overcome whoever it is who mocks and scoffs by standing firm. Maybe... As a church, we need to take a good look at ourselves and our city. Being of good courage. Here we are in Midtown. Affluent Sacramento, government city. Is our witness for Jesus, for the gospel, what it should be? We need to look at it. Bringing Christ to a lost and a perishing city, affluent, materialistic in so many ways, it will take courage. Not everybody's going to love Emmanuel Baptist Church. Not everybody's going to love what we stand for. Be of good courage. Jesus has gone before us. He has overcome the sly little chap. We must trust in him. Now, how does he do this? What is, what is it that fuels his courage in many ways? Well, I think it's the second thing we see here in his, his heart of, uh, toward us. It's seen in his conviction. He's a man of conviction. Now, what does it mean? It means Jesus really believed in what he was and what he was doing. There was no back doors with Jesus, if you like, responding courageously to the Pharisees and to Herod, Jesus makes it clear. Go and tell that fox, that fox that I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow on the third day, and I, f I will finish my course. Notice he makes it very clear. He understands who he is. He is the Messiah. He understands why he's come, to do the will of God. He has a conviction about his identity and about his mission, and it will not in any way be thwarted. 
He says, nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it is for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Jesus knew he was going to Jerusalem to die. Herod wasn't going to kill him. Herod couldn't do it because the Father had ordained that he was to go to Jerusalem and die on the cross. And Jesus had a conviction that he was here to do the will of God and fulfill the mission that God had given him. We talk about conviction politicians and in our day, I'm not really sure what that means anymore, but I know back in the day in the United Kingdom, one of my uh, prime ministers, the one I came polit- became politically conscious under, was Margaret Thatcher. They called her the Iron Lady. She didn't get that name by being a compromiser. She got that name because she was a conviction politician. You go on YouTube and watch some of the videos of her at the dispatch box. They used to say she was the best men of them all, right? This was a woman who believed in what she was doing. Now, don't misunderstand me. She made some terrible mistakes. In fact, the biggest mistake of her political career, she brought in a tax in Scotland, and that was the end. You can read all about it in the Downing Street years. It's an excellent volume on her life. But she was a conviction politician. What does that mean? It means that what she believed in, she did. And she lived out as much as she could with all her fallenness. Well, here's the reality here. Jesus is the embodiment of a man who had conviction about the will of God. He was the one who had come to do the will of God, and nothing would stop him. And he was committed to going all the way to the end with God because he knew he had come to be arrested, to be tried, to be executed, to rise from the dead, to accomplish the salvation of his people. And it's the fact that he had convictions, that he really believed what he really believed, and he really lived by what he really believed, that he was able to be courageous in the face of this man, Herod, and continue forward through Galilee up towards Jerusalem. The convictions that gripped our Lord's heart drove his life. They drove his life. My dear brothers and sisters, I tell you, if courage is lacking in the church in the West, it seems... It's not disconnected from conviction. It's not disconnected from conviction. The church says it believes certain things, but lives as though it doesn't believe those things. And brothers and sisters, we need to look at our own hearts. We need to look at our own lives. And we need to ask ourselves with all sincerity, are we living a Christian life of conviction? Or is it at the end of the day that we really prefer convenience? We'll pay lip service to the orthodox truths. We'll pay lip service to the orthodox uh, doctrines. But the reality is that when it boils down to it, we'll we'll take the convenient direction because the conviction direction might just cost us something that we don't want to pay. Jesus was not a man whose beliefs were those of convenience whatever suited, whatever was blowing in the wind, whatever was popular, whatever would make him a liked individual. He was a man of conviction. What was right before God was right, and he would stay faithful to that no matter what. And I am persuaded that if we do not, as a church locally and as a church in the West— truly address the issue of our lack of conviction, we will be swept away. Our detractors have no problem with our convictions. We hear them all the time. We're battered with them in the media, in the entertainment world, in the political arena, in the education arena. We're battered continually with the convictions of the world. And what has happened? We're a little bit like the frog in the pot. As things have changed, so we have changed. So now we're in a position where you can't judge. You know, that simply just means shut up. That's what it means. We don't want to hear what you have to say, right? 
And the church has said, oh yes, I realize that. We must be wise. And so now we don't have conviction to say, hold on a wee minute. We have beliefs that are of eternal importance. They are a matter of life and death, heaven and hell, right with the one true and living God or rebelling against him. And we are going to stand for those convictions all the way to the end of our lives, whether our lives be short or whether our lives be long. We are going to persevere in our convictions all the way to glory. Brothers and sisters, Jesus went to the cross out of conviction that this was the will of God to save us from our sins, and nothing was going to prevent him from pursuing that reality. And he calls us, as his people, to be men and women of conviction. Know who you are, Christian, and what you believe, the Word of God, and live by it, be shaped by it, motivated by it. So, when it comes to something as simple as personal holiness, do you know what sin is? Have you studied the doctrine of sin? Don't just assume. You become a Christian, you've genetically realized you're guilty before God, you do some bad things, therefore, okay, there's some sins in my life, the rest are all just mistakes. Have you ever studied the doctrine of sin? I tell you, you study the doctrine of sin, Make sure you're studying also the doctrine of grace at the same time, because it's pretty depressing stuff. How depraved we are by nature, how far we've fallen from the glory of God. But we need to see this. We need to understand this. The doctrine of righteousness. Then, of course, the truth of Christ and justification by faith alone. Listen, if you're not studying these things, if you're not being shaped by these things in your mind and in your heart on a regular basis, if what you're doing is filling your mind with Netflix movies or Facebook posts or whatever else, Instagram, whatever else, other stuff there is, and you're not in the Word, getting your word, re- your mind renewed, listen, you have no chance of standing against the convictions of the world. They're going to sweep you away. They're going to sweep you away. Deal with your pride. Do you know what pride is? Study it. Deal with it. Do you know what bitterness is? It's amazing, isn't it? These are the kind of sins that you tell people, you know, you deal with your pride and you back off. You're terrified. It shouldn't be that way. We should be able to come to one and say, hey, you know, <clears throat> I want to talk about pride. But we know it's a difficult one. Bitterness of soul. People who are drowning in bitterness, but they don't see it disaffected, not relating spiritually, dealing with integrity, just plain honest. My yes is yes, and my no is no. That's just plain 101. But you say, well, I'm concerned about holiness. But you're not concerned about your pride. You're not concerned about bitterness. You're not concerned about integrity, sexual purity. You're having a laugh. You're just pretending Christianity. It's frightening, but in many places today, these things are not serious. But in the Bible, they're serious. In true biblical Christianity, they're serious. Do you have convictions about this stuff? Convictions about marriage? Oh, brothers and sisters, it it just gets worse, doesn't it? I read an article this week, now in England. There's a couple, two girls and a boy have decided that three parents are better than two. And so we're going to have threesomes now. And what next? Right? But you see, when the boundaries are down regarding sexual purity and what our Creator has ordained, when the boundaries are down, anything goes. But we as Christians, I think this is going to be a touchstone for us in many ways. We as Christians are committed to what God says about marriage and sex and sexual purity. And we've got to, we've got to hold the line. Hold the line out of conviction. Out of conviction, God defines these things, not us. And how much harm is done when we go outside the boundaries? Oh, I tell you, we're going to reap the whirlwind in another generation. We may not see it right now, but it's been, it's been sown, and it's going to come. We've got to be men and women of conviction. Men and women of conviction about what the church is. 
You might think at times, you know, as pastors, we go on about this a bit much. We don't go on about this half as much as we should. What it means to be a member of the body of Christ, your responsibilities as a member, what it means to be a community, a covenant community of God, what it means to be uh, living together as a fellowship of saints, ministering to one another, and and understanding things like baptism, and the Lord's Supper, and leadership, and government, and worship. These things should be convictions for you, not just, well, you know, we kind of like this at Emmanuel, but hey, down the road they do that, and over there they do this, and you know, we're kind of eclectic, and church government doesn't really matter, the ordinances, you can do them any way you want. No! Jesus, the head of the church, has a heart of salvation toward us. He was a man of conviction. He died to secure for us the benefits and the blessings of his grace, and that we would have convictions about this stuff. And brothers and sisters, we need to, therefore, take it seriously. You see, what you truly believe is how you will truly live. And what you truly believe is what truly shapes your life. Jesus shows us the saving heart toward us was a heart of courage and a heart of conviction. Thirdly, we see it displayed in his compassion. His compassion. Notice what he says. Speaking about the reality of having to get to Jerusalem, because that's where it was the traditional, normal way, place for the prophets to be put to death, he then opens up his heart in lamentation. Now, there is discussion as to whether he actually uh, said this more than once. He says it in his Passion Week. I'm persuaded here that what Luke is recording is what our Lord's heart disposition was and what he opened up with regarding his concern, his lamentation for Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is to be understood simply as the, he- the, the, the central place of worship for all of Israel and for the nation. But here is his heart. And what is it? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. Sent to it from where? From God. Why? Because they've departed from the Word, and these prophets were the mouthpiece of God to call God's people back to covenant faithfulness. And here's Jesus the fulfillment of the prophets, the final prophet of God, the, 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 the revelation, the final ultimate revelation of God to us. And he is lamenting in his heart over the, the, the spiritual state of, of God's covenant people. And what does he say? How often would I have gathered you children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. There is a depth of lamentation here that I cannot capture and portray to you. But what I can say to you is, is here is a heart of compassion towards the perishing that Jesus expresses. He cares. He is lamenting. He is mourning their condition. Here he is in their midst, the one that was being promised to them, the very seed of Abraham, the fulfillment of all the covenant promises of God, the one who would bring all the blessings of God to the people, and they would not receive him. Here he was curing them. Here he was healing them. Here he was teaching them, and they would not believe in him. And his heart is broken. It's broken. It's broken. You see, you can have courage and conviction and compassion in your heart all at the same time. Jesus does. He is the God man, but here he is, the perfect man, the man filled with the Spirit of God. And as he ponders, these people, as he looks them in the eye, as he sees the older people and the younger people, as he sees the men and the women and the boys and the girls, and they're all listening to him preaching, and he's thinking upon even these Pharisees now. Maybe they're the same bunch that keep following him around, or maybe there's one or two that are always about, but he's looking at them, and he's thinking about it, and he's saying to himself, I'm getting closer and closer to Jerusalem to be put to death, and I've been preaching to these people, and I've been pleading with these people, and I've been calling these people, yet they will not believe. And he is lamenting. He is weeping in his heart. 
Just like Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, who'd gone before him several centuries, Jesus cares. Jesus has a heart of compassion for those who will not hear him. How important this is for us to see. Because it's true, isn't it? That we can be bold, and we can have conviction, but we can be hard in that. We can be harsh in that. Scotsmen have a tendency to be that way. I think Northern Europeans are kind of wired, it seems sometimes like that, compared to other parts of the world. At least that's my personal opinion. You don't have to agree with me, but I just know my own propensities. But here's a good word, right? Here's a good word beside the idea of being a man of courage, a woman of courage, a man of conviction, a woman of conviction, a man of compassion, a woman of compassion. And I want to say to you, if you're not a Christian here this morning, this is Jesus' word to you. He cares. And he calls. And he says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, weighed down with sin, you're guilty before God, weighed down with shame before God because of your, your sinful conduct, come to me. What does he say? I will give you rest. He cares. He's pleading even this morning, 2,000 years later, as he sits in glory, as he puts this weak Scotsman in the pulpit to bring the gospel to you. He calls. He pleads. He has a heart of compassion. He cares. He says, come. Come to me. He will save you if you will face your sins, face your guilt, Face your shame and turn and trust him. He will save you. He cares. You see, what's, what's Jesus' heart in heaven? Still before he comes back in judgment, there is room for repentance. There is room for salvation. Oh, when he comes and his judgment will be over, there'll be no more room. But while there is room, right now, today, do not harden your heart. Hear his voice and believe and be saved. That's his word to you as an unbeliever. To those of us who are Christians, he's saying to us, have my heart when you deal with a hostile world. Be men and women of courage, men and women of conviction, but men and women of compassion. What do you have that you have not received? It is all of grace. What has been given to you that is not of mercy? It is all of mercy. You are not a Christian this morning because you're better than anyone else. You're a Christian this morning because it seemed right in God's sight to save you. And that should keep you humble. And as you look at your co-workers, and as you look at those in your neighborhood, and as you, even perhaps if you're in a marriage that's difficult, one is saved and one is not, you must keep your heart of compassion toward those who are not yet in Christ. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, this is something that is cultivated over years of faithful communion with Jesus. You need the Spirit of God to help you to do this. You do. You can't do it yourself. You won't do it yourself. Jesus shows us the way. As he looks over the city, as he sees the temple, as he sees the teeming hundreds, thousands of people, he recognizes that they have they have had their opportunity here. He has come amongst them, but he also knows what is going to happen. Oh, he's going to enter into the city. They're all going to be Hosanna, Hosanna. But then with a very short space of time, it's going to be crucify him, crucify him. He is lamenting because the prospect of what is coming for them if they do not repent is terrifying. Just as for you, my dear unbeliever, if you do not repent and trust in Christ, the prospect for you is terrifying. The judgment day will be terrifying for the unbeliever. For the believer, it is our day of vindication. Hallelujah. But for the unbeliever, it will be a day of utter terror. 
And so we must pity those who are heading to destruction. We must care for them in spite of their hostility, in spite of their uh, desire to do us harm, in spite of their unwillingness to heed our message. We are to be a people of compassion. Christ's heart, his saving heart is displayed not only in his courage, uh, not only in his conviction, but in his compassion. And then, fourthly, it is displayed in his concern. Notice the last part of the text. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Here is God's final prophet, the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to his wayward people, directly addressing them. He employs Psalm 118 and verse 26 which is really a benediction in that psalm. And it is a, it is a psalm that speaks of uh, <coughs> the people receiving the entourage and the leader of the worship in the temple. And, and Jesus here is basically saying to them, you are refusing to receive me. You need to realize the implications of God's hand of judgment. He is going to leave you desolate. The door is closing. You are in grave danger. And it will then not be until the Messiah returns at the end of the age that they will see him. Now, is this a warning to Israel? Or is this a message of hope to Israel? This is a very interesting question. I think there's a measure of both here in this concluding concern that Jesus expresses. He expresses concern that uh, they're going to be judged. That's concern for the people. But I think there's a message of hope. He's not saying to them that there's absolutely no way back to God, but he is telling them that he's the only way and that they need to believe. Now, what is going to happen historically after this? Historically, what's going to happen after this is Jesus is going to die. He's going to rise from the dead. He's going to go back to glory. And then within about 30 uh, years, the, 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 the apostles are going to be writing the New Testament. And then by the AD, year, year AD 70, Jerusalem is going to be completely destroyed. And anybody who's hearing these words and anybody in that generation, they're going to hear the gospel potentially, yes, after the resurrection and the ascension, yes. There were many on the day of Pentecost heard it, and many entered in. But then God's purposes are going to turn away from Israel to the world. Does that mean that no Jew can be saved? No, of course not. Jews are still being saved, but they come in through uh, the church. Does that mean there's not yet a future possible restoration for Israel that is yet possible? I'm not closing the door to that. But what I think Jesus is simply saying to them here is this. It's a word of concern, a word of concern to them that judgment is coming. And that unless they come to him, they will face it. And they will perish. And here is his heart, you see. He's not afraid to say hard things. He's not afraid to say difficult things to people. A willingness to say the hard things. You realize that without me, you are going to face judgment. You realize that in rejecting me, God is going to abandon you as a nation. That is a heart of concern to tell them the truth. Yet there is hope in this sense that still if they will come to him, still if they will trust in him, they will be saved. He will be going away to glory, but he will come again. But they will not see him until that coming. None of us will see him until that coming. And he's saying, between now and that coming, trust me, you can still be saved. But it's a word of concern regarding judgment that he speaks. Now, isn't it the case that we need to be a people, if we care for people, that we're willing to say these difficult things to people about these hard things? I mean, how many of us, if we're being honest, like the soft things about the gospel. The nice things, you know. God is love. God will comfort. God will care. And all of that's true. But God is holy. And God will judge. And God will punish. They're equally true. And concern for people doesn't draw back from the harder things about judgment that have to be discussed. I'm not saying by that 
that you go in tomorrow to your work and you stand up and start bringing a word of condemnation to everyone, that would be foolish. But what I am saying is this, that as you seek to live for Christ in this hostile world and walk as Jesus walked, and as you cultivate the saving heart of Christ in your own heart for those in the world, you're going to have to deal with these things. You're going to have to speak the word of concern, the concern about sin and the lifestyle and judgment. If you really care, you'll go there. If you really are playing at it, you won't. Now, there's a way to do it, and there's a way not to do it, of course. But do it, you must, in certain contexts. And all of us know this, don't we? All of us know that in witnessing opportunities, conversation is going along well, and it's great. Let's talk about the cosmos. Let's talk about the God who made all things. Let's talk about God's big plan and, and Jesus. And it's all going really well until we get to the point where the question goes, the, the, the conversation goes this way. Are you saying by this that if I don't believe in Jesus, I'm going to hell? And you gulp, and you know. Are you concerned for that person? Are you prepared to look them in the eye lovingly, courageously, with conviction, and say, without Christ, you will perish in your sin? and face eternal punishment, yes. There is no pleasure in telling you that, but that is the truth. For God is holy, and God is just, and God is a God of righteousness. And if He did not spare Israel, He will not spare anyone if they will not believe. And so, therefore, if we have a heart that is like the heart of Christ, it will not only be a heart there's a heart that has courage that comes from God and convictions that are coming from God and compassion that is coming from God, but it will be concern to say even the harder things, to present even the more difficult truths. Brothers and sisters, I am persuaded that if we do not do this, it's a big part of the reason why I think our culture's in the mess it's in. The church hasn't done its job. Who is going to warn if we don't warn? Nobody else believes that they need to be warned about the judgment to come, about the wrath to come. Oh, we love to have, at least in Northern Ireland, they used to love this, prophecy meetings. All about prophecy, when Jesus is coming, and this and that, and we want to put the Battle of Armageddon here, and we want to put this here, and that. We love, but we're not warning people about the judgment and the nature of the judgment and what is coming. We like to speculate, and we'll even argue with each other about it and speculate about how, where, what goes where and when and why and how and which. And, and yet we're not, we're not telling the world what they need to hear. Judgment's coming. That is a message of warning. But there is hope. Jesus has come. Trust in Him and you will be saved. My dear brothers and sisters, listen, if we are going to have a saving heart towards the world, we're going to have to have a concern to speak the harder things to the world and realize that's not going to be received by everybody. Not everybody who heard these words from Jesus patted him on the back and said, thank you. I'm really glad you told us. God's going to abandon us. We're going to be judged, and you're going to be gone. And, until we, and if we don't believe in you, then we're going to perish. Not everybody did that. It wouldn't be very long before he gets into Jerusalem, and all of this comes to its conclusion, and they condemn him to the cross. And they think they've silenced him. But God had a purpose in his son's death, as we know, to accomplish redemption. He raised him from the dead. He ascended him to glory. And he tells us he's coming again. And in that period between his first coming and his second coming, whenever that is, this is the day of salvation. This is the day of opportunity. This is when the words of concern need to be spoken. This is when we need to be telling the world that they might be saved. And so when we think upon this, can we truly say that we're understanding the saving heart of Jesus as we should? 
I think Luke wants us to grasp something of the emotional, passionate intensity of our Lord. He's, he's, he's courageous. He's, he's a man of conviction. He has deep compassion. He has concern. He wants us to see this. Why? Because this is what is driving our Lord all the way to the cross. This is what is going to take him to that place of death where he will defeat death and death will die. And we need to understand this. We need to grasp this. If we are followers of Jesus, then we need to understand this is his heart toward us. And as he sits in glory right now, his heart is the same still. He wants us to be courageous in the world in doing the will of God. That's why he saved us. He wants us to have conviction about God's Word and live it out in the world. That's why he saved us. He wants us to do it with compassion, concern, and care for those around us. That's why He saved us. He wants us to have this concern. Speak words of concern to people. Be willing to do it. That's why He saved us. As He sits in glory and rules over all the affairs of our lives as our King, I want you to reflect this morning on Christ's heart, His saving heart. And what makes up that saving heart is his courage, his conviction, his compassion, his concern. And if you would have a heart like Christ's heart, you've got to go to him and you've got to tell him that you want that and that you would like him to instill it into you and to develop it into you and cultivate it into you, that you would be like him. You see, what does it mean to be like Jesus? This is what it means to be like Jesus. Men and women of courage to do God's will. Conviction about what it is. Compassion toward those who are against us, will not follow Christ. Concern. All of these things are part and parcel of a a saving heart. Because these are the things that are in the heart of Christ. They were in the heart of Christ on the earth. They're in the heart of Christ now. And they will be fully manifest when he comes again in his glory at the end of the day. May God help us to think much upon our Savior, to contemplate much of what he's like, to reflect upon his heart toward us, and know this, that his heart is genuine and sincere and perfect, and we should want to have a heart like the heart of Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we close, we confess that we are not what we ought to be as your people. We confess, Father, that very often we lack in courage to do your will. And when we look at your Son, we stand amazed, spirit-filled man, wholeheartedly committed to doing the will of God. We bless you that he was a man of conviction, what he believed he lived out. Forgive us, Lord, that we do not live out what we say we believe. But help us, Father. Help us to grow in this. That in a day when many have convictions about all the wrong things, you would give us convictions that reflect the convictions of Jesus. We pray, Lord, we would have the heart of compassion that Christ displayed even in our passage this morning. We confess, Lord, we do not care nor love, nor lament the lostness of those around us. Forgive us, Lord. Create in us compassion for the lost and the perishing. Give us concern. Concern that's not just in our hearts, but spoken from our lips, even when there are hard things that have to be said, even when there are difficult things that have to be said, that, oh, God, we would speak your truth in season to those who need to hear it. We thank you this morning that we have such a great and a glorious Savior. We thank you for the heart that he had that took him all the way to Calvary, where he accomplished our redemption, was raised from the dead, ascended into glory, and we thank you that even now as he is in heaven, his heart is the same toward us, for he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And may we, O God, as we strive to be like your Son, seek to be like him in heart. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.